I woke up one morning to know that I had been. I am when I finished the last series, uh, Showtime was very generous and said, look, if you ever have want to come back to us with another series, Penny Dreadful or anything else, we'd be, we'd be happy to hear it. And, you know, the first series to me was a very closed book. You know, we wrote the end. It was a beautiful story. I loved doing the show, but I never thought I would sort of revisit it. And then, you know, as you know, we went through a seismic change in the world in the last five years. And, you know, as a writer, you're either going to whisper about it or scream about it. And I wanted to scream about it. So I was struck by certain parallels to our world now and the challenges facing us and the 1930s in America. So the more I researched, the more fascinating it became. And as you know, Los Angeles history is Latino history. So the idea of exploring a folk Catholic figure like Santa Morete seemed appropriate to the world. And it seemed like uh, a story that was penny dreadfulish to me. Detective Mishner, Detective Vega. So what gets us up so goddamn early? Welcome to homicide. Even though it's set in 1938, it's about 2020, and the rise of political extremism, of a sort of irresponsible political demagoguery that has real world consequences about a foreign power, Germany in the case of 1938, being a threat to our institutions, you know, as well as the rampant rise of xenophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, and particularly for me, the marginalization of minority communities. Because as the son of an immigrant, I'm very sensitive to that. And you know, I began to think about what it would be like to live in one of those neighborhoods that was displaced to when the freeways were built. And thus the show. Is there a version of Magda in Texas? Is there a version of Magda in Poland? Is there a version, you know what I mean? Like, or is she just bouncing from city to city? <laughs> you know, she's, she's an immortal goddess, is the important thing to remember. So, so the rules of, of sort of geography and sort of temporal reality don't quite exist for her the way they exist for us. But I think she's chosen Los Angeles very specifically as a place she wants to start enacting her seductions and her threats and her manipulations because of the various forces at, at play here. It's the day. All mankind needs to become the monster he truly is, is being told he can. Was it hard to find locations? It, it was challenging because a lot of LA is gone and it's been displaced by parking lots and freeways and shopping malls and strip malls. Um, so to f try to find a pre-freeway Los Angeles was challenging, but thankfully there's enough beautiful architecture, some of it art deco architecture that still survives, and certain buildings that are iconic, like City Hall, for example, uh, or the Pasadena Civic Auditorium that are sort of from that period and redolent of that period in a really authentic way. And we've been all over this city like, like scurrying rats to every corner to find those things that felt and looked like 1938 to us. Can you tell us about sort of the role of radio evangelism in the, in the new season? I mean, I know that comes into play and we don't right. really see much of it in the episode that we've seen at least. Right, I mean, what's so exciting about uh, the character that Carrie Boucher plays, Sister Molly, is she sort of represents Amy Simple McPherson in a way, who was a very powerful female evangelist in the late 30s and early 40s. And what's significant about it is coast to coast radio was a very sort of newish thing. And suddenly the public airwaves had a reach beyond anything they'd ever had before. So to be a woman who has that much power was very unique and special um, and based in Los Angeles. So I did a lot of research in Amy Simple McPherson in building, building that character. But again, it, the question is, is what's the provocation for a modern audience? And to me, it has to do with how we perceive and receive information. You know, it might be our iPhones now, it might be the internet, but the idea that there are ideas out there, there are words out there, there are speeches and songs out there that can be good or bad, depending on how, how you take them. Uh, that was the thing for me. And certainly, you know, recreating the, a world where a radio evangelist could have that much power and celebrity status was very interesting to me. What do you love about working with Rory Kinnear? You've it's, worked with him a few times. You know, pound for pound, he's just one of the great actors and one of the great human beings. And he has the ability to paint so many colors so realistically. You know, Rory is a believable actor. Even when he was playing Frankenstein's creature in the first series, he was very empathetic. You know, you're drawn in, you're very, he's a very sympathetic actor because 
he has great love for these characters he creates, and I wanted to treat myself to the chance to work with him again. And when this world has burned, there will be no one. No one but you and me, sister.